So in this video, I want to talk about Freya and Sia, because I feel like they're two sides of the same coin in how they are very heavily intertwined into Belle's life, how they are very much drawn towards Belle, and I just want to talk about them as individual characters. But a couple of clear disclaimers, no, I will not be talking about spoilers, so do not stress, spoiler free, but I will be talking about some side story stuff that is not in the anime, and it will not be in the anime because it's side story volumes that are not covered, so do not stress, no spoiler content, but I will be going over side story stuff to give context to certain characters and stuff, and so I want to be very clear there. And another thing as well, and this is something that comes with part of the course as far as my content goes, I like to analyze things. I like to yap a lot. I'm the master yapper. That's what you come here for. That's what you enjoy. And just because I'm explaining why a character does something does not mean I justify the character's actions. I like to understand and read and get a deeper understanding of why characters do things the way they do. One of the things I've always found funny about Freya as a character is me explaining why Freya does things the way she does instantly always provokes a person that has the literacy skills and the listening comprehension skills of a preschooler telling me that I'm somehow justifying her doing the things that she does. And especially when I criticize Freya, in critic well, more so criticize Hestia, then people go, oh, well, you're criticizing Hestia, so you must be justifying Freya. It's like, no. If you're going to do that, I'm just simply going to block you because you're clearly just not very good at reading and you're clearly not very good at listening and you're not worth my time. But I want to talk about these two characters because they're both characters that really are drawn towards Belle. As I stated, they've got a lot of reasonings for it. And I do feel like Freya and Hestia actually have a lot in common because when you look at Hestia's backstory, her backstory is actually quite lonely. She doesn't exactly get along with all the other gods and goddesses. She's kind of an outcast. She kind of hides away in her books and kind of does her own thing and doesn't really get along with it. And that's why her and Hephaestus are really the only, like Hephaestus is her only really good close friend. And even then Hephaestus sometimes doesn't really want to put up with her shenanigans. And then you look at Loki and her and Loki just do not get along. But hey, Loki be Loki. That's what Loki does. And so, yeah, you can see that Hestia is quite a lonely character. And so when she sees Bell and takes him on board, she's very heavily drawn towards him. And she's very motherly about her approach of how she goes about her affection. I don't think she has genuine, like, love and affection to the same degree as, say, like, two lovers are. I think her love is very heavily motherly, but I sometimes do think, sometimes, and this happens in the real world, sometimes mothers can be a little bit overly protective and sometimes stop others from approaching them in a more romantic sense because they're trying to protect them from everything. And I think that's the thing about Hestia. Is she has good intentions, but as the saying goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And so I do feel like she overly smothers Belle. I know I've repeated that in a couple of other volumes, but I kind of wanted to explain the reasoning behind it because I do feel like she's very similar to Freya. Because Freya, as I mentioned in my last video, and this is kind of like drawing the two videos together and kind of showing how they're both kind of very similar, is that Freya is very similar in that she's also quite lonely. She has that kind of aura about her that she just automatically charms people around her and very few people can resist that charm. And Hestia is one of those. And so <laughs> it's one of those that Freya is very lonely and isolated in the basic sense because it's like, well, she can't find true love. Any anyone can sit there and say that they're in love with her, that they want to be with her, but are they really in love with her, or is it the charm effect? And that's the thing with Freya, is that she's got to kind of sit there and go, well, they're just in love with me because of the charm effect kind of thing, the passive kind of aura. And so for her, she kind of lives a very lonely and isolated life as well. Just going outside or going out into the public eyes instantly draws that attention that kind of can feel a little bit suffocating in a way. While Hestia is the complete opposite in that she's completely isolated, people don't really get along with her, she kind of doesn't really like dealing with people, but they're both lonely, and they're both drawn to Belle, a character that seems to really draw their love and affection, but one of them goes about it in a very motherly way, while the other one goes about it in a very uh, overly dominating wife kind of, I want to get you down and dirty and completely you know, get a <laughs> boing jiggle out wow. But the thing about Hestia is she is very molly. She's controlling. 
she's blocking anyone else from getting close to Belle. But Freya does the same thing. But let's use a hypothetical. Let's say Freya was to win Belle's heart over and Belle was to fall passionately in love with her. Would Belle just not be treated as another one of her toys? Would she just end up having her fun with him and then put him on the on the shelf and go, oh, that's my next toy? Or would she genuinely try to pursue a relationship? And again, that's a what-if scenario. You'll never really know the answer to that. But it is an interesting question to throw out there is if that scenario did happen, how would that relationship grow? How would it delve? And especially with all her other party, like her familiar members, and this is one thing that I, I absolutely hey, is her familiar members. They're weird, they're zealotly, they're like a cult. Like, they go about how they show affection to Freya in the worst ways possible, which is kind of ironic because Freya goes about showing her affections to people in the worst way possible as well, well, particularly to Belle. And so you can kind of see where her familiar members, I think, get some of the more negative traits from Freya. It's one of those characters that I feel like, like I said, they're very similar, but quite different at the same time. Hestia and Freya, that is. They're both very lonely. They're both kind of isolated. And they're both drawn to the same person. But how they are lonely is quite different. And that's why it's such an interesting parallel to look at these characters as how they go about their possessiveness, their controlling nature. And how, in a sense, yeah, they can be kind of seen as misunderstood. Both of them are in that case. I'm not defending one or attacking the other one more, but simply pointing out that, yeah, they're both like that, and they both have their reasonings. I mentioned in the last video that, in my view, is that when people do things, they always have a reason. And I've seen some people try to counter that, oh, well, evil people just do evil things, and it's like, that's you dumbing things down. If you're dumbing it down to that, and if a story is like that, then I feel like that's a bad story. Like, if, if an if a anime or a live action TV show dumbs a villain down to just bad be bad and that's it, then it's removing any of the character development and the complexity behind it. I mean, if it, the entire point of the story is to kind of do that because there's no, like, they're just bad and they don't have a backstory because they just don't want to get into it, I, I can understand that to a point. But I do feel like some of the best villains out there are the ones that are explained in their reasoning. Some of the, not just villains, but bad people, people that make mistakes. I like those kinds of characters because it makes you feel like you can connect and not necessarily connect like, oh, I do the exact same thing, but try and connect with them in a reasoning. You you try to understand that. And again, you're not justifying their actions, but simply trying to come halfway to the table and being like, hey, explain your story let us understand why you are the way you are and i think that makes for some of the best characters out there the more fun and interesting characters out there and i feel like that's how humans are in the real world is people do things for a reason but i do feel like a lot of times people dumb things down because they don't want to think too hard about that because it's easier to just go yeah they're bad they do bad thing and then just leave it at that and don't try to understand why again understanding why doesn't mean you're justifying their actions so to be very clear there i do think what freya is doing to bell and what she has done and what she will do is definitely very bad but I do feel like Freya as a character is severely misunderstood. And I think it's the exact same for Hestia. I give Hestia a lot of flack, but for good reason. She's just she's just not best girl. I'm sorry. She's just not. But <laughs> joking aside, not really. Freya is best girl. But <laughs> stir in the pot. But looking at them, they're both characters, like I said, that kind of very have those interesting similarities and differences, and they kind of intertwine kind of nicely. And these are the two characters that I find that are probably the most interesting to see throughout the story, particularly Freya, because she's more of an outcast in the actual main story itself, while Hestia is seen as the main star of the show. What I would also say is there are some other gods and goddesses that do get some other interesting kind of little bits of delves into why they are the way they are, but they don't get the same amount of detail as Hestia and Freya. Those are the two, honestly, in Darmachi that get the most love and attention. 
And I guess the question is then, is why? I mean, for Hestia, it's understandable why she gets the most attention. She is the main goddess of the story. She is Belle's goddess. And so it makes sense why she gets some of the most attention. You could also look at Loki for the side story. But I do feel like Loki still doesn't really get the same amount of attention. Even as much as Freya. And Freya isn't the main goddess of the story. But my god, does she get a lot of attention to detail. And maybe it's just because the writer really likes Freya. But Freya is just one of those that has been set up as an opportunity to really have a lot of fun with. So again, I'd love to ask the question off to you, the individuals. What do you think about the parallel between them? What other gods and goddesses do you think are the most interesting out there? I would say the other one that I find most interesting is Hephaestus. And then probably... It's probably a toss-up between Loki and Hermes. But I do really like Hephaestus, and I would love to see more of Hephaestus and why she does things the way she does, more of her backstory, more of an understanding. But because she is more just a friend to Hestia, you're never really going to get much of an attention of detail to her as a character. So again, love to know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Keep it civil, keep it chill. If you like this video, hit the like, subscribe, and I'll see you beautiful nerds in the next video.